Hello, I'm Dr. Menson. I'm the medical director for the pulmonary rehabilitation program. And uh, this short video is going to be about advanced directives uh, for healthcare. So um, I wanna just, I'm just showing you here uh, what's called the short form for the Vermont Advanced Directive. Um, you can get all of these forms to the Vermont Ethics Network online. Um, and I'm just gonna go through with you uh, what an advanced directive is and uh, what specifically you need to fill out when you are doing one um, and how it's beneficial. So some of you may have an advanced directive already. Um, this is simply a tool or information to provide your healthcare team if you're unable to make explicit decisions for yourself. So it's kind of exactly like the name implies. Uh, it is uh, directions for, uh, to make an advance uh, for, your, for your health and your care. So the reasons people fill this out um, are generally when people get older. Uh, we probably naturally have all thought about um, things that we would be agreeable to versus not agreeable to, and these are very personal decisions. So it's very important um, for your team to be able to know exactly what is acceptable to you and what's not. Obviously, this can be a difficult thing um, for people to think about um, because a lot of us don't like to think about our own mortality. Um, but you may have been in a position where you have been witness to a family member or a friend who's been going through end of life care. Um, and you may have formed some decisions about what you uh, are uh, accepting of um, when that time may come for you. And since this is not applied broadly, since this is such an individual thing, it's really important um, for us as your medical team to kind of understand what you, um, what's important to you and what you're in agreement with versus not in agreement with. So getting started, um, there's multiple parts to this form and the beginning does show you instructions. Um, so just getting to the first part here, Part one is naming a healthcare agent. So you can literally name whoever you want to be an agent or um, a decision maker for yourself uh, if you can't speak for yourself. Uh, now the only person you can't assign is your physician um, unless they are your relative. So most people I would say choose their spouse or a child or a sibling. Although you definitely do not have to do that. Uh, you could pick a good friend or an in-law or a cousin. Um, it can really be anybody you feel like knows you best in regards to these decisions and can make these decisions for you. Uh, you can also name co-agents, so people who would have to make decisions together. Keep in mind that you want these people to be of sound mind so that they could, they could make these complex decisions. And if you are going to name co-agents, you want it to be people who um, get along or could be in agreement about making these decisions. There are spaces on here to provide people who you also would want to be included, but wouldn't necessarily be the official um, agent to make the decision. So if there were other friends or family that you were very close to that you wanted to have involvement in the decisions, um, you can feel free to put them here in this box. There's also a part that uh, comments that, there's a, that there are people who can be excluded. So if you have um, maybe a family member that you're estranged from, or worried about ulterior motivations, uh, you could put that information here. The last part of part one just talks about uh, when you want this to be activated. And so generally people select when they can't make decisions for themselves. 
um, there would be instances where maybe somebody has been diagnosed with dementia or a neurocognitive disorder, and they might enact this advanced directive to happen now, uh, just because there's a risk of further cognitive decline. Um, part two talks specifically about your goals for healthcare and your wishes. So uh, this is kind of when people are talking about what quality of life they would be accepting of. And you can see here that you have kind of three main categories. So the first one is that you want your life sustained as long as possible. So this would be people who would be accepting of living in a hospital, living in a long-term care facility, living on things like a ventilator, and we'll explain what that means later. But basically, somebody who is fine with doing anything that prolongs the amount of life as much as possible. The middle column is people who want life-sustaining treatment, so aggressive interventions, but only if it meant that they were going to have meaningful outcomes in the end. So this would be, you know, accepting of a long hospitalization as long as you were able to communicate or live independently or not have pain. Um, so I'd say a majority of people end up picking something within this, um, within this column. And you can select as many things here as are important to you. Um, so maybe uh, not being able to talk is not necessarily your priority, but living without pain would be. This is where you would kind of clarify that. And then some people when they're filling this out are really transitioning to more of a comfort-based plan or um, a palliative plan. And in that case, they only want therapies that are going to be directed at symptom relief, pain control, um, things that improve quality of life only. And that would be a comfort-directed plan in this column. Now, here you can express any additional beliefs or wishes. So, uh, you know, thinking about things like, well, uh, you know, I saw my grandmother break her hip and go through a long rehabilitation course. And, you know, that was not acceptable to me. So if you have personal experiences to draw on, or say, you know, my grandmother broke her hip and it took her a really long time to recover, but she then went on to have somewhat of a meaningful quality of life. And so I want to be given that opportunity to go through a rehabilitation program and get home. You know, this is where you would kind of expand um, on your personal experiences or feelings. There's also a place here to, know, to, to alert your healthcare agents and your physicians that if there's somebody else that you want to have notified if you are de dealing with a life-threatening illness. So um, for instance, if you uh, have a pen pal or a friend from college or uh, somebody in a religious group that you're close with and maybe your friends and family wouldn't necessarily think about that, you can put here that this would be important for them to be notified. Um, and then there's a pieces about what's important to you. So people have thought about if they want to die at home, if they would rather die in a hospital, if they'd rather die in more of a center, like, a, like the respite house, which is a, a home for hospice care. Uh, so just thinking about this, some people say, you know, I know that dying at home may be an increased burden to my family or my home really isn't meant for that kind of care. So, you know, I'd rather be someplace else. Or some people say, I just really need um, the relief of being in the hospital, um, that, would, that would not be a burden to me. That would be um, an acceptable way to pass. They can clarify that here. Uh, and then spiritual care and wishes. So if you do follow a certain faith, um, if there's a place of worship that you go to, and anything that might bring you comfort. So if there's a specific type of music, um, you know, hearing people read, uh, 
comfort lighting, so lamps, um, things like that would be what you could clarify here of things that bring you uh, relief and kind of a grounded, um, bring you uh, comfort in times of stress. So part three is kind of what I wanna focus on here um, as far as the medical pieces. And this is where we talk about what treatments would be acceptable to you versus not. And it kind of breaks down to two main ones. Um, and then numbers three and four are more applicable for people who might be chronically declining at home. So number one talks about what to do if your heart stops. And I wanna be very clear about this because that is when your heart is no longer pumping any blood throughout your body. Um, so that is, if we did not intervene at that time, that is when somebody would pass or die. Um, in order to try and reverse that, we do what's called cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR. And that's exactly what you think of when you see stuff on TV. Um, maybe you've witnessed it happen in person. Um, but that is where somebody actually does manual compressions to keep blood throwing th flowing throughout your body in an attempt to restart it. Now, as you can imagine, the people who do best with CPR are people who heart, who, whose heart have stopped because of a problem with the heart. So if a heart stops because of a heart attack or an electrical problem, those things can be hopefully fixed. If your heart stops because you have such a severe infection, so say you had a bacteria in your blood, um, that is much more difficult to have somebody survive and do well afterwards. So it does kind of depend on the context. And so sometimes if people have a life-threatening condition, so, um, like a high grade cancer or uh, an, a severe autoimmune disease, you know, if their heart stops because of those things, it's much harder to, to fix or reverse um, a cardiac arrest in that situation. So when you're thinking about this, you want to think about how things are going for you now. So you're participating in pulmonary rehab. Our hope is to get you feeling as good as possible and as active as possible. Um, so you wanna fill this out how you feel now. Um, there might come a point where your symptoms progress enough that you decide that if this happens, you would not want CPR. And so if you are contemplating this or have already made this decision, you can place that you don't want CPR here, but it's really important that you also know that you have to fill out a COLST, which is a clinician order for life-sustaining treatment. This is an actual order um, that has to be signed by a medical provider saying that a patient is not to receive CPR. Um, otherwise, uh, anybody who reacts to you or if your heart has stopped, they have to act in the best interest um, and kind of by default. And so uh, unless you have this COLST form available, so we recommend people carry it in their purse or in their car and sometimes do things like get a medical alert bracelet that says that they are a DNR or have a DNR. Um, usually get a form in a bright envelope, like a bright orange envelope. We say, leave it on the refrigerator in your house. Um, you know, that, that it's very clear that there's an order to not restart your heart. So that's CPR. The other thing we think about when people talk about heroic measures are uh, mechanical ventilation or breathing with a machine. And so, uh, in this context, sometimes people um, may develop something like a pneumonia or a COPD or asthma exacerbation that is so severe that we can't turn it around with other therapies um, just short of intubation. So this would be putting a breathing tube 
through your mouth that sits down into your windpipe or your trachea and having a machine that breathes for you. So this is what is happening during the COVID pandemic that some patients need. Um, it can happen during if you've developed influenza. Um, so this is where a machine will really breathe for you while your lungs recover. Uh, there are other instances where you could be sick enough to need a breathing machine, like having a stroke or having a severe infection somewhere else that alters your ability to be able to breathe. So the breathing machine is really just something that gives your lungs rest and support while you recover. Um, the uh, there are three ways to think about using a, a breathing machine. The first one kind of gets at what we had mentioned earlier about patients who uh, or people who are okay with living indefinitely on machine or assist devices or in a nursing home, and that would be people who would want a breathing machine indefinitely. And what we're talking about there is. Um, doing something called a tracheostomy where the breathing tube goes through your throat and sits in your airway permanently and you live on a breathing machine. And if that's the case, generally people are not sedated for that. They're able to be a little bit more interactive and, and um, interact with people. Uh, there's a short-term course for a breathing machine. So that's a breathing machine just to kind of get you through an acute event or an episode like I was talking about, so flu while your lungs recover, um, or an asthma exacerbation while your lungs have time to kind of heal and uh, cool down. Um, and then some people say, no, I've had a breathing machine before, I did not tolerate it, I don't want it again. Or, you know, my dad needed a breathing machine and it was really hard um, and I don't find that acceptable. Uh, now, I want you to know that if you were placed on a breathing machine, we do give you medications to sedate you or relax you so that you aren't dealing with the discomfort of a breathing tube in your throat. Um, so it's not, it's not as though you're awake like you are now and trying to deal and fight with this thing in your, in your uh, throat. Obviously, an exception to this would be if you were going in to have a surgery or a procedure and you'd be okay with intubation for something like that, that's obviously different. This, this would be only if you were having respiratory failure or were not able to breathe on your own. And again, we've come a long way in terms of things that we can provide as far as therapies. So there are a lot of other devices that can provide a lot of support outside a breathing machine. And we always try those things first. Um, we really only choose intubation uh, if a patient really uh, cannot tolerate anything else that we can provide them. Now, I mentioned that three and four are kind of more long-term issues. So, uh, you know, I think the analogy I provide for something like this would be um, if you lost your ability to be able to eat or drink. Uh, so a scenario might be that you've had a large stroke and you're unable to feed yourself safely anymore or take in enough nutrition. The question is whether you would want a uh, feeding tube uh, to be able to provide you with nutrition. So there are long-term feeding tubes, and again, they're, they're fairly comfortable. Um, they would go through the stomach and into, or through the outside of your abdomen and into your stomach where you would uh, just put food through the tube. Um, and then there's short-term feeding tubes, and then there's uh, the option to never have a feeding tube. Now, I will say that if you are in agreement with a short-term um, breathing tube, so the ventilator, it is very standard for us to be able to give you a temporary feeding tube and that just goes through your nose or your mouth while you're sedated to provide you with nutrition while your body recovers. Um, so again, if you had something where uh, you were unable to swallow and that wasn't going to get better, that's where you would want to think about if you're 
accepting of a long-term feeding tube. And then number four is saying that if you were terminally ill, so if you were at the end of your life and your physician team identified things that we commonly encounter when people are actively dying, so things like a pneumonia or a urinary tract infection, you have the option here to um, either say you do or do not want antibiotics. And sometimes people feel that that is an accepting and comfortable way to pass away, that we would only focus on symptom relief, but we would just let the infection um, kind of not impede uh, the natural course of the dying process. Uh, the last box here on this page um, talks about uh, additional limitations. So commonly the parallels I draw here are, you know, would you be, if you have kidney dysfunction or your kidneys don't work well, would you be willing to undergo dialysis? Um, if you had an aggressive cancer and it returned, would you be willing to undergo chemotherapy again? Um, or maybe you say, you know, we've, I've talked to my oncologist and if a cancer did return, I would only want radiation therapy. This is where you would really specify what you're accepting of um, outside of those kind of four things we just talked about. So part four is about um, after you pass away. So this is about organ donation, um, tissue donation, and uh, what kind of um, process you want as far as uh, burial versus cremation and stuff like that. So um, keep in mind that if you have a driver's license, you may have already consented to being an organ donor, um, which is a legal contract. So you want to make sure that the two of these go hand in hand. So if you are an organ donor on your driver's license, you want to make sure that this form matches. If you've rethought about that and do not want to be an organ donor, but it says so on your license, you should make the appropriate changes um, to change that aspect uh, so that these things coincide with one another. A question that comes up in this group a lot is, well, I've got really bad lungs. Like, do I don't want to donate my lungs. Um, there is a nonprofit organization that um, facilitates organ donation who thoroughly screens patients for um, tissue and organ donation after death. And I assure you that I would allow them to make that decision. Um, they obviously are, um, you know, taking into heart the, the best thing for the patient who would be receiving the organs. And so having a chronic lung disease would probably um, not allow you to donate your lungs, but there are other things that we can donate very easily. Um, that make a big impact on the person who's awaiting uh, that organ. Um, the other thing that comes up here are if you have a more rare lung disease or even if you don't have a more rare lung disease, um, thinking about whether you would want to donate it to donate your organs to science so that um, you know uh, places like the Vermont Lung Center can further understand this disease um, that you have. And if that's the case, I really recommend you talk with your doctor or your pulmonologist about those things. Um, if you actually wanted to donate your entire body to science, so say to like the medical school, that is something that has to be done far in advance of your passing. Um, and there is information online about how to get in contact with medical schools um, or medical societies to donate your body for science. Some people may have already uh, made funeral arrangements, have a lot, um, have decided on cremation services. You would put this information here. And if you had specific wishes about services, you could put that information here as well. Part five is where you just um, sign and make this form valid. And I wanna be very clear that this is very important. Um, because all of this will be null if this is not filled out correctly. So this is where you sign that uh, you have filled this out in accordance of your wishes. 
And then you actually need two people who are witnessing your signature. And very important, they can't be people that are your agents, okay? So um, it's really best to pick somebody completely different that's not listed anywhere else on this form because it doesn't want to appear that there's any um, undue pressure put on you to, to have them be making decisions for you. Um, we want this to be um, very clear that you, you made these decisions of sound mind and not under any um, duress. So you'll need two people to sign. If you live in a nursing home or a residential care facility, you'll need to have a third person and it kind of specifies who that person can be. Um, but that's again for additional protection. Once you've signed this, you wanna make sure that you send this to all the, the places that need it. So your primary care doctor's office, the hospital. Um, if your primary care is part of the hospital, it will get embedded into the entire network. Um, make sure that your agent, so anybody listed here as a healthcare agent, has a copy of this paperwork. And then if you say you winter in Florida or um, you spend time anywhere else, it's, it's good to register it there at that hospital or at that provider's office as well. Part of the last page of this, completing this, gets um, a, a red, registering it in a national database. So um, you fill out this information in your emergency contact, and then you either mail or fax this form in. Um, what that will do is it will get it into a national database. You'll get information back saying that uh, you've been registered. And uh, you even get like little stickers you can put on your driver's license so that people know to look for your advanced directive. Um, and then they contact you intermittently to make sure that your information is up to date. Um, so that is the advanced directive. There's more information online um, to help you answer questions about filling it out. Uh, the Vermont Ethics Network has a great booklet uh, that goes through all of these different parts and really kind of explains all of the things um, that all the questions that may come up and then I highly highly encourage you if you are filling this out to discuss it with your health team so your primary care doctor your specialists um, we are here to help you um, and especially answer questions if there's anything that comes up um, individually with you uh, so um, Thank you very much for your time. Um, if you have any further questions, we are going to meet and kind of go through this. Um, and as always, um, Julia or the physical therapist is there to help you with this as well. Okay, thank you so much. Be well.